the members, um, it's members' questions. Can I ask that members who wish to ask supplementary questions stand up and state supplementary? And also that any supplementary questions are put forward clearly and briefly. Councillor Osborne. Question number one to the leader, please. Um, Madam Mayor, I thank Councillor Osborne for his question. <clears throat> Part one of the question we are familiar with, and I think uh, both the question and answer we are familiar with. And the part two, it's got an interesting uh, take. Uh, I would say that Councillor Osborne will know that on this side we are a pragmatic uh, group, but we are also an innovative group. And as when it came to staff mutuals, we didn't really take lessons from uh, Lambeth next door, because I don't think they have anything to teach us. What is also interesting is that whilst we were thinking about having staff mutual, and uh, Councillor Osborne, I know, has had a number of meetings with, his, uh, with the leader of Lambeth, both past and current, um, never shared the so-called delights of the ways of doing business in Lambeth. And of course, my colleagues would say that uh, there is nothing the Labour Party as a whole could possibly teach us given the fratricide uh, the party is currently engaged in between its uh, founding fathers and its uh, inheritors. It's quite interesting that the man who made the leader is uh, currently being knifed by the leader himself. So I'm not sure that uh, that, uh, that is the right place to learn lessons from. Our interest in staff mutual is very plain and very straightforward. It is the interest of our residents that we wish to promote. We wish to give them quality services at a value, at a price they can afford. And if our staff can go do that job, then why shouldn't they? And of course, it's not the first time that council staff will have competed against the market and won. Operational services regularly competed against the market and has regularly won and provided exemplary services. So, Mr. Mayor, I don't think we have got lessons to learn from anywhere else. I think we can do it on our own. Uh, is it not the case that when we debated mutuals at the last council meeting, uh, specifically the line in the uh, majority party's uh, uh, position paper, which referred to mutuals, uh, I spoke positively about them and talked about Labour and Conservative councils implementing mutualised arrangements. Never once mentioned Lambeth Council. Um, but one of the Conservative councillors here that night, tweeting away, said, um, Osborne wants us to be like Lambeth Council, presumably based on what I'd said about mutuals. And in fact, all I was doing was referring to the mutuals that you are proposing. I think we can be forgiven for thinking that it's not a very straightforward matter from your point of view. Who's in, who started this all off in the first place? Mr. Mayor, I'm surprised how touchy Councillor Osborne is about tweeting. I think many a people have become victims of tweeting doing the wrong thing, and many a people have become victims of it reading it and taking it to heart. It is, I understand, quite a light-hearted kind of uh, exchange. People shouldn't really read too much in, into it. 140 characters hardly convey things. And if, I'm also surprised that if Councillor Osborne's interest in restructuring of this council is as deep and passionate as it is, so that it merits question number one, his supplementary is entirely about hurt feelings. Councillor Dunn. Um, we know we've had to make some cuts, some expenditure cuts, but the Wandsworth way is to preserve frontline services, and we're all very conscious of that. And what I wanted to ask him was, given that these cuts are being imposed on us, we're not always very happy about them. Does he think that in Wandsworth we have got that balance right? I, I thank um, Councillor Dunn for her supplementary. Of course, we have got the balance right. And, and, and one thing we shouldn't forget is that these cuts are not imposed on us because of the current coalition government. They're imposed on us because the last Labour government mishandled the finances. They are the ones who have left behind a legacy that have created the mess that we are in. But in, in coping with the mess, and you know, the current financial indices suggest that uh, we might be succeeding nationally. And certainly locally we have succeeded. We have saved £70 million by and large without attacking any of the frontline services. And there are further reductions to be made, and I am sure all through that. 
all of the colleagues here will make sure that as far as it is possible, frontline services will remain protected. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Councillor Osborne, second supplementary. Uh, question number two to the Leader, please. Um, well, the question is very much as printed. I mean, I sort of fail to really make much of uh, the purpose behind the question. What I do know is that regularly when this council asks residents about their levels of satisfaction, we are usually in the kind of 70 plus mark. Uh, by and large, residents in this borough have been satisfied with this council, the services it provides, and when we get something wrong, our ability to put it right and apologize if necessary. That is a hallmark of a responsive council and we hope to continue to do that. The Mayor. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, will the council leader allow me to congratulate him on an exquisite piece of Orwellian doublespeak in his answer to me here about complaints to the council, where he says that if you take out the two areas where there have been massive increases in complaints, then overall the complaints have gone down. The inner party would be so proud of you. I think um, Councillor Osborne needs to understand, in a sense, the rationale behind it, because it is always, well, he, well, I, it seems he didn't, um, because when a contract changes, and particularly something like refuse and street cleansing contract, there are a number of problems, particularly on this time when the rotors were changed, the days of collection were changed, it was a single collection as opposed to two separate collections. Virtually everyone in the borough had some change in the way their, their rubbish had previously been collected or their streets had previously been swept. Inevitably, that bedding down period causes enormous amount of disruption and there are complaints and, in the, and, and the council has been upfront in recording them and uh, tackling them. I think the key, key thing is that uh, this uh, afternoon I was, uh, somebody pointed out to me that the, oh, an Earlsfield resident had tweeted, tweeted, Council Osman, I hope you won't get upset by this gentleman's tweet. It says that I love the cheap rates and excellent services there, and I can't understand why other councils can't use this as a benchmark. For me, that is a hallmark of the services we provide, and that is a hallmark of the satisfaction levels we have. Second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to ask Leader a question, actually, unlike my colleague on the other side. Um, I think uh, he would like to say um, that uh, surely uh, he's pleased to be leading a council that does um, show such openness in its transactions and also the fact that we have such a commitment to transparency in all our facts and figures and um, a continuous improvement in everything that we're trying to do here on the side of the house. I Council, I thank Councillor Humphreys for his supplement. He's absolutely right that uh, it, it, this council is a responsive council. And council Cook has just pointed out to me that the complaints from the ref to, about the refuse collection and, and street cleansing is at an all-time low because the contract has come to, to settle down and it is now getting right. So, thank you. Question three, Councillor Madeli. Question three to the leader. empty and un undeveloped because of actions by this council because m my predecessor and my predecessor planning colleagues will, uh, will know that every time a planning application has been made for that re redevelopment of the site, 
The council has approved planning permissions, and what has failed is the financial markets and the development cycles that has not come up with the finance to deliver the planning approvals. That is why there has been a delay, but it has not been a delay as a result of this council doing something or not doing something. And I also say that it's hugely heartening that there are effectively two governments behind what is happening at, at Battersea Power Station, and indeed the two neighbouring authorities as well as the Greater London Authority. Supplementary, Councillor Nadelli. <laughs> well, I think that Councillor Nadelli will know that there is an application currently outstanding uh, with the council. And the council hasn't determined that uh, application, and in due course, council will determine it. That's, why, that's when she will know what the council's views on the chimneys. My own personal view is this, that when the council came up with the suggestion that uh, the, the, the first chimney could be brought down and re-erected before further chimneys could come down was largely because of some sort of doubt about the financial stability of the developers uh, at that time promoting the, the, the applications. On this occasion, I have to say I have no such financial doubts, but of course planning colleagues would need to consider the planning implications and, and come, come through with a, a decision. All the way through, we will want to make sure that English Heritage support what Council wants to do or Council, uh, uh, Council agrees to do in terms of this application. And so far, we have had the support of English Heritage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, would the leader agree with me that the um, speech from the Malaysian Prime Minister was extraordinary in its... Um, obvious feeling and understanding for Battersea and as an example um, the expression he used about describing the power station as the grand old lady of Battersea warmed the hearts of the audience that were there. I thank Councillor Tracy for her supplementary and she's absolutely right it was a, an incredibly well crafted speech but delivered with some passion and understanding about not only you know this part of London but about this building he almost encapsulated why that power station meant, means what it means to Londoners and why his commitment to regenerating it was, was sort of fulsome. A question for to the leader. Um, I thank Councillor Daly for his question. Um, the whole s stack of statistics that he's, he's requested, which are to the letter part of the answer, I say that on the right to buy and house sales, on this side we have been absolutely clear and convinced that the reason why we promote and we think it is right to promote right to buy and home sales is because there is an enormous appetite in our, amongst our residents to be homeowners and what we are doing is facilitating that and assisting them to have the same kind of choices and freedoms that many of us here enjoy. I buy a house, I live in it, I acquire an equity stake in it, I can trade my equity stake when I want to and I don't see why a council tenant should not have the same exact same opportunities just because as a council tenant I don't see why they shouldn't. I'd also say that the money that has been generated from the right to buy sales have been of enormous value to the housing uh, department and the housing stock. Our stock remains incredibly well maintained. It is well maintained both inside and outside. We have a 100% decent home standard rating a long time ago, long before any authority had, had that rating. And we have exemplary housing management services. So the money has given people freedom and opportunities, but it also has meant that the, the estates are well maintained and well cared for. Supplementary. Um, I thank the leader for his answer. Um, um, actually, we're not opposed to right to buy on this side of the chamber. I think you know that. Uh, what we're opposed to is not using the receipts to build new homes. And these figures make it very clear that for three decades you haven't been doing that. And that has led to the housing crisis that we have in this borough now with not enough social homes for those on low incomes and not enough affordable homes to buy or to rent for those on middle uh, and even now higher incomes. Um, 
Could the leader give us a flavour of what he intends to do? We're not talking tens of homes that the uh, Hidden Homes Scheme is building here, which you think is worthy of putting a press release out about. We're talking about thousands of homes that are needed. Leader. Well, perhaps uh, Councillor Daly could identify a stretch of his ward where a thousand new homes could be built. Um, and perhaps uh, when he succeeded in providing that, he could engage with his residents and ask them whether they would like a thousand new homes in his ward. Councillor Daly is talking about cloud cuckoo land po uh, politics, really. What we're doing is what we can do. We, the, the Hidden Homes Initiative now copied in other local authorities, including some Labour authorities, and have the cheek to call it Hidden Homes, having so far refused to, in fact, touch this particular initiative. We believe that Hidden Homes could provide well over 10,000 homes across London if other authorities followed our, our, our model. That is, that is our contribution to creating new homes in London. Find an innovative solution to a problem and make sure that other local authorities follow where we lead. The fact that they don't is something that he probably needs to raise with the London Labour Party. And I also say that his central thesis that we should have used the money to build new homes fails to and remember what I said in, 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 in answer to the question itself, that we have invested the money to create decent homes and maintain the homes that we have to, to a habitable standard. The truth is there are a number of local authorities in London, mainly Labour, where their housing stock is in such dire state that whilst they have homes, they are not livable. In fact, uh, talking about um, Councillor Osborne's favourite borough next door, I have to say one of, um, one of the cheekiest suggestions I had from the Lambeth leader was that they wanted to use the 106 contributions coming out of Nine Elms to top up their decent homes budget because their decent homes were not decent enough and they needed an awful lot of money. Now, you know, we didn't want to do that because we had already done it. Now, and, and that was financed largely through the proceeds of right to buy income. So either you could have lots of homes that are empty and unlivable, which seems to be Councillor Daly's suggestion, or you have the homes, maintain them, and have them fully occupied. Second supplementary, Councillor Ellis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I was, uh, I'm sure the leader was as interested as I was to hear that uh, the uh, group opposite are all in favour of right to buy. Uh, the, their enthusiasm for it uh, uh, has escaped us all this time, so it's refreshing to know that this was their policy all the time. I wonder if the leader actually recalls that in the, the Labour Party conference of 2011, in September, uh, the then new leader, Mr Miliband, said some of what happened in the 1980s was right. It was right to let people to buy their, buy their council houses, and we were wrong to oppose it. Does he think that that message was ever... Does he, does he believe that that message was ever iter reiterated by anybody from this side prior to the leader of the Labour Party saying it uh, 18 months ago? Uh, I thank Councillor Ellis for his supplementary. I have to say that I've been in this council for a, quite a long time. The Labour Party was vehemently opposed to right to buy, and certainly, if not right to buy, to making it easier for people to buy, initiatives uh, that promoted right to buy, budget variations to buy, a uh, right to buy caravan show were opposed. I think the Labour Party's position has changed marginally and it then, then came down to saying, well, we don't oppose right to buy, but we won't uh, support you on initiatives you want to do to promote right to buy. Uh, and of course, when the Labour Party had a chance to do something in, in government, chance to do something about right to buy, what did they do? They actually made sure that it became less and less attractive for, for council tenants to buy. The, the amount of discounts was slashed, they, the discounts didn't keep pace with inflation, and in fact, in, in every way but, uh, but formally cancelling the scheme, they made it impossible for people to, 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 to buy. And the government's recent uh, liberalisation or, or increase of the discounts, we have had an upturn because the demand for home ownership remains as high as ever. Uh, Councillor Ioni Cooper. Uh, my point of personal explanation actually relates to the comments of Councillor Ellis, the Cabinet Member for Housing at this time. I joined this council in the year 2006 and for four years I led for the Labour Party on this council. I made speeches throughout that period and have done since then saying that I fully support the right to buy and I fully support all types of tenure 
across this borough. I find it extremely invidious unless Councillor um, Ellis is suffering from some sort of memory loss for him to suggest that until 18 months ago nobody in the Labour Party including in this council has supported the right to buy, the right to own, the right to share to own, the right to be a tenant in public housing, the right to be a tenant in private housing. Thank you Madam Mayor. The time for questions. Uh, the time for questions to the leader is now over.